I close as promised with a special comment on the debt deal. Our government has now given up the concept of right and wrong. We have in this deal declared that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all political incumbents are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are renomination, re-election, and the pursuit of hypocrisy. We have in this deal gone from the four freedoms to the four great hypocrisies. We have superseded Congress to facilitate $750 billion in domestic cuts, including Medicare, in order to end an artificially induced political hostage crisis over debt originating from the bills run up by a Republican president who funneled billions of taxpayer dollars to the military-industrial complex by unfunded, unnecessary, and unproductive wars, enabled in doing so by the very same Republican leaders who now cry for balanced budgets, and we have called it compromise. And those who defend it have called it a credit to a pragmatic president who wins some sort of political points because having stood for almost nothing here, he gave away almost nothing for which he stood. It would be comical if it were not tragic. Either way, it is a signal moment in our history in which both parties have agreed and codified that the political structure of this nation shall now be based entirely on hypocrisy and political self-perpetuation. Let us start with the first of the great hypocrisies, the committee. The Republican dogs can run back to their corporate masters and say they have forced one and one half trillion dollars in cuts and palmed off the responsibility for them on this nonsensical super Congress committee. For two and a half brutal years, we have listened to these Tea Party mountebanks screech about the Constitution of the United States as if it were the revealed word and not the product of other, albeit far better, politicians. They demand the repeal of amendments they don't like and the strict interpretations of the ones they do and the specific citation of authorization within the Constitution for every proposed act or expenditure or legislation except this one. Where does it say in the Constitution that the two houses of Congress can in effect create a third house to do their dirty work for them, to sacrifice a few congressmen and senators so the vast majority of incumbents can tell the voters they had nothing to do with this? This leads to the second of the great hypocrisies. How in the same breath the Republicans can create an extra constitutional super Congress and yet also demand a constitutional amendment to force the economic stupidity that would be a mandated balanced budget. Firstly, pick a side, ignore the Constitution or adhere to it. And of what value would this mandated balanced budget be? Our own history proves that at a time of economic crisis, if the businesses aren't spending and the consumers aren't spending, the government must spend. Our ancestors were the lab rats in the horrible experiments of the Hoover administration that brought on the Great Depression, in which the government curled up into a ball while it simultaneously insisted the economy should heal itself. When, in times of crisis, then and now, the economy turns out to be comprised entirely of a bunch of rich people who will sit on their money no matter if the country starves. Forgotten in the Republican voodoo dance, dressed in the skins of the mythical balanced budget, triumphant over the severed head of short-term retrenchment that they can hold up to their moronic followers, are the long-term implications of the mandated balanced budget. What happens if there's ever another war or another terrorist attack or another natural disaster? or any other emergency that requires a government to spend one dollar more than it has. A constitutional amendment denying us the right to run a deficit is madness, and it will be tested by catastrophe sooner than any of its authors with their underdeveloped imaginations that can count only contributions and votes can contemplate. And the third of the great hypocrisies is hidden inside the shell game that is this super Congress. The Super Congress is supposed to cut evenly from domestic and defense spending. But if it cannot agree on those cuts, or Congress will not endorse them, there will be a trigger that automatically cuts a trillion two or more. But those cuts will not necessarily come evenly from the Pentagon. We are presented with an agreement that seems to guarantee the gutting of every local sacred cow from the Defense Department. Except if the congressmen and senators to whom the cows are sacred disagree and overrule or sabotage the super congress. Or except if for some reason a 12-member committee split evenly along party lines can't manage to avoid finishing every damned vote six to six. We're cutting defense. Unless we're not. The fourth of great hypocrisies is the evident agreement to not add any revenues to the process of cutting. Not only is the impetus to make human budget sacrifices out of the poor and dependent formalized, but the rich 
and the corporations are thus indemnified again and given more money not merely to spend on themselves and their own luxuries, but more vitally they are given more money to spend on buying politicians, buying legislatures, buying courts, buying entire states, all of which can be directed like so many weapons in the service of one cause and one cause alone, making by statute and ruling the further protection of the wealthy at the expense of everybody else, untouchable, inviolable, permanent. The White House today boasted of loopholes to be closed and tax breaks to be rescinded later by a committee, a committee that is yet to be formed. There are no new taxes except the stealth ones enacted on 99 out of 100 Americans by this evil transaction. Every dollar cut from the safety net is another dollar added to the citizens' cost for education, for security, for health, for life itself. It is another dollar he can't spend on making a better life for himself or at least his children. It is another dollar he must spend instead on simply keeping himself alive. Where is the outrage over these great hypocrisies? Do you expect it to come from a corrupt and corrupted media for whom access is of greater importance than criticizing the failure of a political party or defending those who don't buy newspapers or can't leap website paywalls or could not afford cable TV? Do you expect it to come from a cynical and manipulative political structure? Do you expect it from those elected officials who no longer know anything of government or governance, but only perceive how to get elected or how to pose in front of a camera and pretend to be leaders? Do you expect it from politicians themselves who will merely calculate whether or not it's right based on whether or not it will get them more contributions? Do you expect it will come from the great middle ground of this country? with a population obsessed with entertainment, video games, social media, sports, and trivia? Where is the outrage to come from? From you! It will do no good to wait for the politicians to suddenly atone for their sins. They're too busy trying to keep their jobs to do their jobs. It will do no good to wait for the media to suddenly remember its origins as the free press, the watchdog of democracy envisioned by Jefferson. They are too busy trying to get exclusive details about exactly how the bank robbers emptied the public's pockets to give a damn about telling anybody what they looked like or which way they went. It will do no good to wait for the apolitical public to get a clue. They can't hear the clue through all the chatter and scandal and diversion and delusion and illusion. The betrayal of what this nation is supposed to be about did not begin with this deal, and it surely will not end with this deal. There is a tide pushing back the rights of each of us, and it has been artificially induced by union bashing and the sowing of hatreds and fears, and now this ever more institutionalized economic battering of the average American. It will continue and it will crush us, because those who created it are organized and unified and hell-bent. And the only response is to be organized and unified and hell-bent in return. We must find again the energy and the purpose of the 1960s and early 1970s, and we must protest this deal and all the goddamn deals to come in the streets. We must arise non-violently but insistently. General strikes, boycotts, protests, sit-ins, non-cooperation, takeovers. But modern versions of that resistance, facilitated and amplified by a weapon our predecessors did not have, the glory that is instantaneous communication. It is from an old and almost cliched motion picture that the wisdom comes. First, you've got to get mad. I cannot say to you, meet here or there at this hour or that one, and we'll peacefully break the back of government that now exists merely to get its functionaries reelected. But I can say that the time is coming when the window for us to restore the control of our government to ourselves will close, and we had damn well better act before then. Because this deal is more than a tipping point in which the government goes from defending the safety net to gutting it. This is wrong. And while our government has now declared that it has given up the concept of right and wrong, you and I have not and will not do so.